grateful to have the opportunity this morning to open God's word with you and share what he would want us to hear from his word. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Ryan Koppel, one of the elders here, and uh, this morning we will be in Genesis 21. Uh, I'll be taking the baton uh, this morning, and um, while I may speak a little more slowly than Pastor Josh or Pastor John, I'm pretty sure I could outrun either of them in a foot race. <clears throat> um, but we'll be in Genesis chapter 21 uh, this morning, so I'll give you a minute to turn there, um, because we will be reading the entire passage, and then I'd like to introduce our focus this morning on El Olam, the everlasting God with a story. So if you are able to stand for the reading of God's word, I invite you to do so now. If you must remain seated, I trust that you will do so with a reverent heart. Genesis chapter 21, the words of the Lord. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac your offspring for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me look not on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. When she, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy and he grew up and lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land that, where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, 
I did not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba. Because both of them, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. You may be seated. Everlasting God, we come before you in humble prayer asking for your blessing on the preaching of your word this morning. Get me out of the way, speak through me, that your people may be here, may hear and be edified and encouraged to praise and worship and give thanks to you, the everlasting God. Amen. As I said, I wanted to introduce this morning with a bit of a story, and the story is a bit of a biography, biographical sketch of a young boy. Um, We would say he was raised in quite an oppressed area. He um, was of a people who were not treated well, and so his parents thought it best that he leave. And in attempts of having their boy leave, he ended up being instructed in the government school. He grew up being instructed in this government school until he was of a mature age, um, but still young and brash, like a lot of young men are, and made some Decisions that forced him to flee the place where he grew up, to head out east. When he headed out east, he came to know God. And God was calling him to go back to that land and to rescue the oppressed people. While he was there, God performed many miracles, miraculous signs and wonders. And this man led the people out of that territory and into a new territory. And this man was also called to lead this people into a new land, a land that God had promised to them. This man I am referring to is Moses, as many of you have guessed. And Moses became a songwriter. Moses wrote Psalm 90, which we have already read this morning in the providence of our Lord. Psalm 90 marks the beginning of the fourth section of the book of Psalm. Psalms is divided up into five sections, and section 90, chapters 90 through 106, um, start with Moses' words. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting You are God. Moses writes these words as a man who had sojourned, lived in many different dwelling places, lived in the dwelling place, the the tent, the tabernacle, for a time while he was leading God's people. But here he says, Adonai, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. 
As Moses begins this division of the book of Psalms, there are frequent recurrences to this term, everlasting. Uh, You'll find it repeated in Psalm 90. Um, Psalm 93 has several references. Uh, Psalm 102, verse 12, and Psalm 105, verse 4. We don't have time to read them all this morning, but I encourage you to review um, what God has written about his everlasting nature. When we come to understand the everlasting God, what Moses brings out here in verse 2, he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or evermore you had formed the earth and the world, we need to understand that the everlasting God is our creator, the one who had made all things. In Genesis chapter 21, that's how the passage starts. We see, the the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. So here in verse 1 of chapter 21, we're introduced to the God who speaks into creation. Just as in the beginning, Elohim, God, Yahweh, the Lord, who created all things, now fulfills his promise and accomplishes what he has said. The everlasting God will always keep his word. In fact, the everlasting God loves words. The everlasting God, our God, has chosen to reveal himself to us by words, by revelation. And in chapter 21 of Genesis, we find five unique sets of words. Uh, So if you're keeping score, you can keep track with me. But here's the first one. Uh, This unique set of words in verse 1 is... The Lord visited Sarah as he had said and did to her as he had promised. In the Hebrew, both of those words mean to speak. When God makes a promise, he simply speaks. God doesn't have to say something and then, okay, I I promise that I will do this and add to it. God simply says, opens his mouth, communicates words, and it is as good as a promise. We see this same pattern of these two words in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Every time that God speaks is his promise. He is not as a man. He does not lie. The everlasting God is different because you see we are created and there is only one uncreated the theological term for this is aseity 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 combines two words to mean of self god is of himself God does not exist in the same way that everything else exists. Everything else exists because God has spoken. God is. God does not just exist. God is. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, not you were God, not you will be God, you you are God. God does not change ever because God is of himself. Nothing that you or I do can change who God is, what he has said, or his plan. As this God has spoken, 
we see another theological uh, paradigm to acknowledge, and that is God's transcendence and his imminence. That God is a seity, that God exists apart from all other things. He is transcendent. He is above and beyond. He is everlasting. And yet, this very God is imminent in our world. He speaks to his people. And here in the opening chapter, verses of chapter 21, we see that God visits Sarah. God accomplishes things in physical time and space. He is imminent. And the everlasting God is perpetually involved in accomplishing all that he has promised. As we look at the beginning verses of Genesis chapter 1, there are several things that should remind us of the opening chapter of the book of Genesis. It says in verse 2, And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Three times we're told that this son was born to Abraham. Three times in the book of Genesis, we're told that God created male and female. The writer here is wanting us to be reminded of God's creative nature. And specifically with this son, this is a son that is born to Abraham. It's of his seed. It is a miracle that Abraham and Sarah in their old age were able to conceive and bear child. There is a, another miraculous conception of a child, Mary, which was quite different than this. This is Abraham's true child, seed after his flesh. But these are the things that we should be reminded of. Again, in the creation account, we're given a list of days. In verse 4, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded. Abraham heard what God had said, what he had spoken, what he had promised would happen, and he was faithful. He did as God had commanded him. And on the eighth day, fulfilled the covenant sign with his son Isaac and circumcised him. That is our first set of words. This next set of words, which God wants to point out to us in this passage, are the words to laugh and to mock. To laugh and to mock. We see in verse 6, Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. This is the laughter of joy, a cheerful heart kind of laughter, which is good medicine for the soul. It's Proverbs 17, verse 22. God made laughter for me, she says. This is repeating again what Abraham and Sarah had done when God originally told them what he was going to do in chapter 17, that this child would be born to them in their old age. They laughed. Same word in the Hebrew, but the context tells us in those passages, they weren't giving a cheerful laughter. There's a, a prefix attached to the word in Hebrew, which points out that their laughter wasn't quite the laughter of joy. Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. In verse 8, the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Typically, there would have been a feast on the day of circumcision. There was so much joy and holy, hearty laughter that they were celebrating with feasts, even to the day 
when Isaac was weaned. Theirs was a laughter of joy. Tucked in here, really quick, in verse 7, again, is another note on the word to speak. Sarah questions, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Who would have said? God said. God promised. According to the flesh, according to worldly wisdom, this thing was laughable, impossible. But God said Sarah would bear a child. And hers was a laughter of joy. We read on, though. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing, is the translation here in the ESV. Some other verses will translate this mocking or playing. The context here tells us that this laughing is not the laughing of joy, and excitement, and why do we know that? Well, first of all, we're not even told exactly who is laughing. We're not given the person's name. It's simply the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. Not the person's name. Hagar, who was a slave, and the Egyptian. The people of the flesh the people of worldly wisdom, the people who worshiped other gods and not the true God. Sarah saw who we recognize as Ishmael. She, she saw him mocking. How do we know that he was mocking? Well, because her response is to cast out the slave woman and her son. Again, she's not even going to name his name. Why? Because for this son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. My son Isaac. I'm going to give him his name. The son of the slave woman, not deserving of a name. He's mocking. We're going to cast him out. So, there's joy. There's excitement. There's pleasure in the laughing of Abraham and Sarah and their family in celebrating the feast. And there's the mocking of Ishmael. And Ishmael and Hagar are asked to leave. God is not mocked. God will always accomplish his purpose. He will always keep his word. Yet God also is the one who hears. This is our third word that we need to focus on this morning. First, first, third set of words. If you recall, the word Ishmael, the name Ishmael, means God hears. Abram and Sarai named their child Ishmael because they wanted to be reminded that God hears. And as we continue in Genesis chapter 1, we're reminded that God hears. Because as Sarah communicated to Abraham, you know, this other son, he needs to go. God told Abraham, you, you, do, you would do well to listen to your wife. Not, not just because of a uh, um, happy wife, happy life. Not just because you should, you should just do everything your wife says, although you should love your wife and please her and treat her well. You're to do this because this is not my plan. I am God and I will not be mocked. Whatever Sarah tells you to do, do that. Not because it's her idea, but because this is my idea. I have already told you. Isaac is the child of promise. I will make you, Abraham, into a father of many nations. 
but not through two children, not through two sons, through one son, through Isaac. And you, Abraham, need to let him go. This is foreshadowing what Abraham will have to do in chapter 22. God hears as Hagar takes the child, um, and it's really not a child in the sense of a, a, an elementary school child. This Ishmael is, is roughly 13 years old. Um, whatever the case, she puts the child under one of the bushes. Under one of the bushes. We're not given a specific name. They're wandering in the wilderness. And under a bush, she just puts the child And yet, in verse 17, God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Again, we're referred to this boy as just this boy. Ishmael. It would kind of sound weird in the Hebrew to say, God heard Ishmael, Ishmael, Ishmael. It would, it would just sound weird. But God hears. God has a plan for every single life. The everlasting God, who is beyond, transcendent from all things, and yet imminent in this world, knows the greatness of setting up kingdoms and the granularity, this very smallness of choosing a son. I did a little research this week on God's greatness. How great is our God? who makes the sun to shine on the earth and give us light every day. Yet this, the sun, is more than a million times larger than the earth that we live on. God orders the earth so that we live on it, and the sun that gives light to it is billions of miles away and millions times larger than our earth. For comparative sake, the offices over here or the kitchen in this building are the, would be compared to the size of the earth as the earth is to the sun. So the office is a million times smaller than our earth. And God knows every specific single human who has ever been born on this earth. God is very intimately aware of all the details. God knows when a child is conceived. When that child is conceived, they're 0.01 inches. That's a million times smaller than our atrium. And God knows and God hears the cry of every life. Because God, the everlasting God, is not just beyond in his greatness. There's a sense in which God understands the hidden, unknown things, the things of detail and granularity. And that's what we see as we follow the story of Hagar and her son Ishmael. So we noted that Ishmael was a son of Hagar, Hagar who was an Egyptian. Another thing to note, uh, we saw that they sat down opposite of a bush, not a specific bush. They found one well that God opened their eyes to see. And then Ishmael becomes an expert with the bow. Ishmael becomes an expert with the bow. 
Um, that's not meant to be a praise on Ishmael. As much as we love hunting, as much as we love archery, as many of us enjoy those things, and we can enjoy that under God. Um, just as different food and dietary things are given in God's word. But it's meant here to be indictment against Ishmael. He's not taking dominion over the earth. He's simply just going and shooting random things. He's not cultivating anything. So God speaks... God is not mocked. God hears. The next set of words that we need to be pointed out here, because God always keeps his word, is the well of seven, or Be'er Sheba. Okay? Be'er Sheba. The well of seven sounds exactly like the well of the oath in Hebrew. The well of seven and the well of oath. In verse 22, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, came to Abraham and they wanted to strike up an agreement with them because Abraham is cultivating the land. He has taken what Abimelech had given to him earlier. It may have been specifically the same Abimelech. Abimelech could just mean the name of the king um, of the specific Philistine people at the time. But these men thought it would be a good idea. We should sign a treaty. We should sign an agreement with Abraham. He's going to get too large. He's going to get too prosperous. And we need to make sure that he does not deal falsely with us. They make Abraham swear by God, Elohim, that they will not deal falsely with him. Abraham has been sojourning in this land and yet has been faithful to display his worship and how he lives so that these men know the God whom Abraham is serving and worshiping, Elohim. They ask him to accept this treaty and this covenant. Abraham says, I will. They go forth and they take seven ewe lambs. And Abimelech asks in verse 29, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs? Why have you set them apart? Well, this is to be a reminder to Abraham and to them of the covenant that they had made. They have made a separate covenant where they have taken the animals and set, split them apart and walked through them as we have already discussed uh, last week. This is a separate dedication that Abraham is giving seven you lamb, seven young, prime animals, seven, the perfect number that Abraham is being faithful to set apart, that he, Abraham, will be faithful to his promise as God is faithful to his promise. So in verse 31, that, therefore that place was called Be'ersheba. Be'ersheba. Be'ersheba means the well of seven or the well of oath. Oath and seven are similar words in Hebrew. So that's our fourth set of words. In Genesis chapter one, God is trying to communicate to us his everlasting nature. But how do you communicate that something is beyond everlasting, transcendent, and something that is imminent, something that is concealed in time and space. And that is where we see our, our last set of words. In verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. The everlasting God is El Olam. El Olam. Olam means everlasting, forevermore, eternity. But its root word is very similar to Alam. 
alam means hidden or an unknown amount of time, something that's concealed. And here what the Lord is trying to communicate is that idea of the God who is. A God who doesn't just exist like we all exist because we all had to be spoken into being. The God who is, is the God who is transcendent, beyond anything and everything that we can think, that we can imagine. And he is able to do these things. See, the last several weeks we've been looking at different aspects of our creator, different names of God. El Roy, God is the God who sees. And El Shaddai, God is the God who is mighty to accomplish these things. Last week, Pastor John encouraged us that God sees and he is able to do these things. And El Olam should remind us that, yes, God sees and he is able, but he is specifically able to do these things in time and space and work them out for his specific plan for all eternity. So what does Abraham do? Abraham plants a specific tree, not just a bush like Ishmael was hiding under. Abraham plants, very specifically, a tamarisk tree. A tamarisk tree digs its roots incredibly deep and rushes the water up to the surface. As Abraham is planting this tree, he knows he's going to come back to these wells to water his flock and give them shade because God has promised to him many things, but including that he will be the father of many nations and that he will have land. So Abraham is being faithful here to do what God is telling him to do. Planting a tree, a tamarisk tree specifically, and worshiping there on the name of the everlasting God shows us that Abraham understands more and more the nature of who God is. The everlasting God that Abraham worshipped by a tree is the same everlasting God that you and I worship. It's the same God that Jeremiah told the people that there is one true God. All the other gods that they made out of wood and hammered out of stone and clay they are false gods. They can't speak anything into existence, Jeremiah 10.10. 10. But the Lord is the true God. And the everlasting, the Olam, king, he reigns. Because this, this everlasting king reigns, he is able to work out his specific promise in time and in space. And his specific promise stems all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and the promise of a specific child, a seed. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us that this child would be born and be given specific names, wonderful counselor, an everlasting father. Isaiah identifies Jesus as the everlasting God. And again, in Isaiah chapter 40, the Lord is the everlasting God. He is the one that we need to be waiting on so that we can rise up on wings like eagles so that we may take God's promise into this world and be faithful with it. As I invite the worship team back up, I have a few applications for us to be reminded of. 
El Olam, the everlasting God, does not discount his word or his work due to age. Abraham was a hundred years old. Sarah was 90. Sarah was getting chased by all these men. But Abraham still conceived a child with Sarah in their old age. God does not discount his work due to age. Or even young Isaac. So if you are young, do not despise your youth. And if you are old, treasure your gray hairs and wisdom. Secondly, an everlasting God does not disregard his promises due to adversity. Leading up to Genesis chapter 1, Abraham and Sarah have tried many different ways to fulfill what they thought would be worldly wisdom to meet this promise that God had given through the flesh. But God was working through the Spirit to bring about his promise. And any adversity will not stand against his promise. And finally, the everlasting God, El Olam, always deserves the praise due his name. He is our God from everlasting to everlasting. We are but dust. He has made us in his image to worship him and bring him glory. And that is what we do as we celebrate El Olam. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord God, thank you for your word this morning and the instructions that you have given us to joyfully seek your word, to understand it, that we may know you, El Olam, the everlasting God, greater and greater. That we may trust your plan and your purpose that you've accomplished in your son as the everlasting covenant for your people. Holy God, give us thanks and joy. Give us praise and blessing as we worship you. In Jesus' name.